Hello, Hugh. How are you? Hello, Paul. How are you keeping? Yeah, good to see you. You're looking very fresh faced there. You too. I think it's the I think it's the outside rather than me, Paul. But anyway, <laughs> I take the compliment. Thank you. Yeah, how have you been? Ah, good. Yes, as far as I can tell, keeping well, keeping healthy, keeping very busy, which is always encouraging. Yeah, and you've been you've said off camera before you've been reading lots of different things, finding things inspiring. Yeah, I've been trying to do the day job but also uh renew quite a few contacts that i've had with people and that's led me to all sorts of reading kind of around and about the subject uh for both work but also to be honest with you i've also um picked up uh, a foreign language so i did schoolboy french and i'm actually trying to resurrect that and uh, get a bit better at it mainly because they say that learning a second language helps me live longer excellent <laughs> live longer perhaps Oh, that sounds, that's brilliant. That's great. Um, so I've known you for a number of years now. Um, mm. For people watching that maybe don't know you, if you'd like to sort of introduce your business and, and your, who you work with and how you help them. Of course I will, Paul. Yeah, of course. Um, the business I run is called The Bid Coach. I'm a director and founder of that. And we've been in business about 11 or 12 years. Um, basically, what we do is we help firms and individuals secure more contract business, um, mainly when they say we must win this. And we do that by helping them improve their uh, communication skills so that they act, their verbal and com written communication skills so they're actually able to articulate their business solutions better. That's it in a nutshell, Paul. Um, we work with uh, ITT documents, we work with their presentations, interviews and behavioural assessments, helping their senior execs perform better. Excellent. And I guess speaking to, to different people throughout doing this series, it is that need to have somebody external to come in because if you're so close to your business and you're not able to kind of critique yourself, it needs somebody to kind of, you know, and how, how is that working with sometimes with being quite blunt and honest with people? And um, well, it, you raise an interesting point there and it can be quite a challenge to say to the MD or the commercial director or something, no, you're wrong. Um, but what I find is clearly whoever we work with, they're experts at whatever they do. Otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. And, the other thing is that they often don't realize is that actually everyone thinks their business is, is unique, but in reality, all their competitors also think they're unique and many of those uniquenesses overlap. So quite often it's not about um, technical wherewithal that gets one, com one company a piece of work over another. It's how much the client believes in them versus their competitors, how much they seem to be closer to the, to the client. So to answer your question, yeah, it's quite difficult sometimes to say to a, a senior exec, just don't tell them about the stuff that you're doing. They know that. That's why you are where you are. What we've got to do is sell them on the, uh, if you like, the psychology, the emotion that they can trust you to do what you know you can do and they know you can do. And can you do it better? Um, so, yeah, I have to be direct. I have to be careful, though. I've got no authority when I work with my clients. So, and I prefer the way of hearts and minds. I'd much prefer that people, if I'm talking to you, I'd convince you, Paul, this is what you should do because I persuade you it's the right thing for you to do rather than just because I say, just do it that way. Yeah. Um, but most often he said, touching wood, uh, I am able to get away with it. And people know I'm only there to help them win. So uh, there's no political prejudice in my thinking. I just want them to win. My background, Paul, is sales, as you, as you know, and for them to win is that great kick of me almost taking the order. So that's the bit that I particularly like, and I, I make that plain to people. I want to I want to help them win. Excellent, and I say it's nice nice to be part of the team and the and the journey putting that together, and then uh, yeah. you know the, the the outcome and succeeding and winning that winning that contract must be a good buzz as well. You know, it's a hell of a buzz, Paul. Um, yes, it's it's a hell of a buzz, and um, it, at the very very worst, I want them to score the best within the sections that we influence. But uh, I do like it most of all when they ring me up and say, Hugh, we've won, thanks very much. It doesn't, doesn't affect my pocket, but nevertheless, it affects my head and makes me feel, makes me feel good. So uh, that's what keeps getting me up in the morning, that, that desire to help them to win wow. something. That's wonderful. So, so how's, how's your industry been and your clients during this time? How, how have you adapted and how hmm. kind of... How very challenging, Paul. A lot of the work we do is on major projects in, say, the road, the rail uh, and infrastructure businesses where, by definition, you've got a lot of people working on a construction site of some form or another. And of course, some of them have been very badly hit. 
but it's interesting that whilst they've been very badly hit and that they can't get large amounts of uh, people to work in say a confined space there are actually some projects that are actually getting more work done because and I'll give you an example on the motorway I won't name it but one of the motorways because the traffic's so quiet yeah they're able to actually crack on and get more work done because they by shutting the lanes which they had to shut and open them in and out of rush hours to obviously let the traffic go by they don't have to do that anymore so they can shut the lanes doesn't affect the traffic and they're cracking on and getting the work done so they're actually ahead of the game but but others are, are definitely suffering and, and several projects have got pushed back yeah um the whole procurement process for them is getting pushed back so a little bit of a mixed bag call and quite frankly some of them are just not sure which way to go whether they should encourage people to go back and work to get on with things or whether they should hold back so yeah a bit of a mixed bag all in all yeah because that's like there's, there's so many things that that influence that in terms of you know the teams the people behind it and and i guess the, you know budgets and and timings and safety obviously is a key thing you mentioned about the roads it's funny because down the road from us um they've been busy digging out the road near the petrol station you know because it, it's it's some for some people it's that opportunity to get it done while you can yeah. um but yeah some of them it is going to push push it back into next year and beyond isn't it yeah, and, 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 and no doubt the economic ramifications of this are, are, are uh, severe. But funny you should mention road maintenance. I spoke to a contact of mine on Friday and he said he works up in London. A lot of the local authorities, and you've just said it near Taunton, they're actually cracking on with, say, pothole repairs simply because they can. Um, they're just easier to get at. So it's, it's, um, that some of them are doing well. It, 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 of course, depends on whether they can get the supplies there as well. It's all very well saying, yeah, we can do that and we can work safely. But if they can't get, I don't know, gravel or grit or yeah. tarmac or plastic bags or whatever it is they need, then they're kind of stuffed. But um, yeah, they're trying to be creative about it, to be fair. They're really trying to be creative. Mm, I think that's, that's a really interesting point because I'd say a lot of, a lot of people are being creative or seeing opportunities and having to really think what they can and can't do. And sometimes it's it's great in, in theory and that you come up with a great idea and then logistically as you mentioned can we get the grit can we get this here how are we going to do it and i've seen that on a, on a local level so i imagine on a you know on a national scale big projects it's just kind of what resources there are in terms of people and you know raw materials to do some of those bits yes and of course people have got to be very sensitive to uh an individual's uh, safety and health and it may well be great for a corporation to say yes we can go back to work safely but if the people involved don't feel comfortable themselves then they're not going to go and, and quite le quite right that is too because um, you know this is this this virus is is serious with a capital S isn't it and you don't want to be putting your your health straight your life on the line unnecessarily mm. um, so yeah I think and I think to be fair Paul this is going to have is going to have very long lasting uh, effects on all of our lives and the world will never quite go back to the way it was you know two or three months ago which is going to have its challenges and its opportunities as well of course yeah uh, i wanted to mention your your blog because you've always been very active with your blog writing i've already mm -hmm. always really enjoyed quite insightful and and the discussions through the, that have built up over time with on that are on the website and um you know there, there's good you're always one that likes a discussion and and you know current affairs and things that are going on and i wondered where with the so what you've been re reading recently what sort of tips and things you've picked up or any ideas along the way yeah, where you're um, at first of all thank you for that uh, that praise i've always tried to put things in in a context of the time in w with which they occur but equally um i think knowledge shared is 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 the best way to have knowledge it's no good me keeping it to myself or you keeping it yourself so i rather i'd like to give something away by way of free information and, and hopefully that does stimulate things and then eventually it comes back to me so to answer your question as to what kind of thing what hints and tips um well i think the medium that we're using now is going to become more prevalent clearly in the new world this, let's face it, this technology has been around for a while, but we've previously taken the opportunity, you and I and many other people, to meet face to face. Well, in, not in, until the medium term at the earliest is that going to go back to how it was, if at all. So I think people are going to have to get used to working with this new technology. And that yeah. can be a little bit challenging. It's probably more the psychology of it than the actual reality of it. You know, the people like Zoom, who we're using today, and all the other programs, they're relatively straightforward to use, but when you're not familiar with them, they feel 
challenging. So in the same way people have to get used to kind of presenting face to face and just do it a lot. I'm suggesting that people actually work with this, try it, run sessions, get join in sessions, see what works for them and then refine what they know. Um, so for example, today, you know, we're both looking at a, a camera, which is a kind of at eye level. I have to be honest with you, Paul, I've got my, my um, PC is propped up on a, uh, on a printer cartridge. So it's nothing, it's nothing sophisticated. I've not invested in anything by way of sophisticated technology, but I've just done something practical so that you don't end up looking at my nose, which is not a particularly attractive thought in, in anybody's um, book. But that's just a, a simple thing. Um, you know, and you and I are both working in home offices. So we've got the doors closed and people are aware so they don't just come charging through as we're doing it. It's simple things. I don't think people need to be over complicated or over, over no. complicate the, the, the whole issue. Keep it simple. I think that's, that's a, that's a great tip because I think, I think, I mean, I know I'm very guilty of it and some of the people watching this will laugh um, that know me is I, I tend to put things off and put things off because I, it has to be a particular way. And what's been good with this is yes, it's not perfect as in terms of the lighting isn't great, the camera, um, but it's spurred me on now that I've enjoyed them to, to buy a new kit and stuff. And my, my, my laptop's on a box as well, so it made me laugh. It's what gets me, it's funny that gentleman that was on BBC a couple of years ago when his children walked in and everybody was like, oh no, and we're all in that situation. Yeah. We're yeah. all that guy. <laughs> yeah, but that, but you know, do you know what people, when people buy things, I was, Ridder, I was writing something this morning, Paul, about people's purchasing uh, decision, their decision making process. And people think when they're presenting, you know, we've got to put lots of facts up there and persuade people and almost browbeat them with the facts. But they forget that a buying decision is made partially emotionally, you know, um, the heart, the pit of the stomach, that kind of stuff. And you should never underestimate that, even in the most formal of uh, purchasing kind of procurement processes. So by being fallible as we are, you know, with a plant in the background or my bookcase or whatever, we're just letting people into our world. And. What's the harm in that? I mean, obviously, you, you want to make sure you've not got anything on the wall behind you, which is potentially offensive. Yeah. But hey, let them see you. They, they're buying from you and me as people. So let them see that. What's the, what's the harm? We don't have to be uh, polished and shiny. You know, we're not BBC presenters. We're Paul and Hugh. And yeah, we're good at what we do. But and let people see the personalities and the people that we are. I, that, that's that's spot on because I think that authenticity needs to come through. Because you say it's, it's that relationship, it's that trust, and 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 I was, you know, it's gone are the gone are the days of of everybody being photographed for the whole library in the background to make them look, you know. I mean, it's yeah. uh, you know, I interviewed uh, uh, Federica for uh, leader of the, the council here, you know, and she's like, I'm in my bedroom, I'm a normal person, you know, this is, you know, I'm accessible, you know, you can talk yeah. to me, I'm a human being. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think I've noticed shifts in in that kind of what's expected of the old old way of doing it is becoming much as we're becoming more used to this. And some people are terrified of videos, and some mm. of the people I've had on here don't. You know, I don't really like doing videos. I'm all right if I'm not being me. If I'm prattling around, I'm fine. Um, but I'm much more conscious when I'm trying to be sensible. You know? Yeah, yeah. But maybe that's us trying. You know, we're trying to play a part. Whereas right now we're having a relaxed conversation, which is just seeing us for what we are and. I think the old days of where the society was perhaps more hierarchical, that was, that was much more important. But now, do you know what, Paul? We're all equal. I mean, again, the COVID virus has, has, has brought to our stark attention that people that previously, from a, a job perspective, wouldn't necessarily mean, Christ, they're important. Do you know what? They're, the, they're what's holding this thing together. There's social workers, the people who do social care, people collecting our bins and the like. Do you know what? Their, their status has suddenly been elevated. And do you know what? Actually, we're all equal. That's all it is. Whether I'm talking to the MD of a company or the, the janitor, the receptionist, to me, they're a person. Mm -hmm. Neither is better than the other. Without both of them or all of them, the business can't survive. So treat people like that. So, yeah, be yourself. Be informal. Be relaxed. Let people see it. No, that, yeah, that, I mean, that, that has been the, the thing, hasn't it? How much we've relied on those people that normally, uh, that, that, with the hierarchical thing you mentioned, yeah, ab absolutely. It's been a great leveller in terms of us actually seeing what's important and mm. how we all do our part in the, in the cog of a business, whatever size it is, you know. Yeah. And um, I was very guilty when I started the business of trying to appear bigger than I was. And it's the whole of I versus we, you know, we think this and I think, well, and I kind of this, oh God, you know, in the end I was just, I think this. And um, I was mentioning something the other day, I, I got more work from my About Us page in the first year than my 
design portfolio because yeah. I put on the, I mean, very hard, you know, hard and mm. sleep kind of mm. this stuff happened and I launched the business. And, and I always say, say to clients, it is about, you know, you need, you need to come through your marketing, your website, mm. which you've done very well in the series of videos and the, and the blog writing. It's, it's inviting a conversation and that's, it's about relationships. You know? Yeah. Uh, and exactly as you said before, you know, I, I don't think I, I don't believe also I've got all of the answers. So I want to engage that conversation with you or with whoever it is and actually tease some of them out of you. And yeah, I want you to, to, to buy from me, not because I'm telling you exactly what I know you need to do, but to help you work out some of the answers for yourself. So again, go back to that. You buy it hearts and minds as much as I sell it. So you're almost buying from me more than I want to sell to you. Mm. Uh, and you've got to, trust me to do that and so therefore you've got to know who I am and what I stand for and we have those those kind of shared values to, to be able to build that and foster that so that you will talk to me openly enough so we actually get to the bottom of what the issues are then we can do something about them mm. so, yeah, absolutely, absolutely Paul. Absolutely. absolutely and and we see that with relationships where if you've got a you know a very large company a big corporate company and maybe someone a high position changes jobs then maybe the clients will go with them because it's the loyalty to the to that person um and it's very much like a, i don't even even like hairdressers you know if somebody if your hairdresser leaves and goes to another salon then your loyalty generally tends to be with the <laughs> it's it does it tends to be with the, the hairdresser doesn't yeah. it the relationship yes, it does. and, and, and the same is true in business and again it's not about the facts it's the relationship you've got with that person the trust that you have that when particularly something challenging happens that they will fix it for you because they've done it before. You know how they're going to respond and react. And, and all systems got processes and procedures. That's not a differentiator. You know, every company says it's got the best health and safety record in the country. Blah, blah. But you want to know that Paul is going to do something for me because that's what Paul has always done. And I know he will. And he'll do it even before I think about it and ask for it because you've built up that rapport on that relationship. And, to the point where you, they, you can actually anticipate the issues that they're going to face and you deal with them before they actually come to the fore. And that's, and that's why you stick with people. Um, and that's, you know, 90% of our business, probably more than that, uh, comes from the same, I'm going to say handful, but relatively small number of clients because we keep doing repeat work for them and we keep helping them win. It, you know, I'm in business to make heroes out of people. And if that's what I do, then happy days. Um, I get my share of it when they come back and ask me to help them again on the next challenge that they face to help them win the next bit, which again helps them become another a hero again in their business. So, and I'm I'm happy with that role. It works. It works. No, oh, and I think we're all and I think we're all in that same role at different places within within our respective uh, businesses. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think um, yeah, it's it's great to hear your passion for for working with your clients and them succeeding say being part of that team and and coming back to win you know work after that so mm -hmm. it's been great some great advice now i will share links to the uh, to the website and some of the blogs that you know the blog articles that go on so people can engage in and pick your brain on on those and say you can you can speak to them back or maybe linkedin and things mm -hmm. i'm going to finish now here on my question i always finish yeah, okay <clears throat> So, you know, if you, if you didn't uh, end up in the, the business sector you're in now, the bids and tenders and, and that kind of thing, presentation skills, what would you do instead? Um, did you have dreams of being a rock star or something? Or <laughs> when you left school, were you told you might be something in particular? Um, okay, yeah, two questions. There's a couple of questions there. What would, I, what would I have been if I hadn't done this? Well, my background is all sales, Paul, which is why I like to take the order. So I've, I've worked for some big corporations and, and, to be fair, learned an awful lot from them. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I went into sales for no strategic reason at all. After university, I basically, I needed a job and I wanted a job with a car. So sales seemed to be the, the obvious thing that I had no particular drive to be in sales. I didn't even see myself as a particularly confident individual. So that's what, that's where I actually went. Where would I have liked to have gone? Well, like many boys, I would have loved to have been a footballer, but quite frankly, I got two left feet. Uh, and whilst I'm competitive and like to win, I never had the skill set to, to, to do that. Um, so that was that was that one. The other th I had two other things. My dad was a farmer um, and I never had any particular farming ambition, quite honestly. It seemed to be um, an awful lot of shoveling for a, a relatively small amount of reward. I won't say what you were shoveling, but I'm sure you can put two and two together <laughs> on that one. Um, but I never, never aspired to that. Having said that, I've been in small holdings since. 
and I would have liked to have been a, um, a train driver as a boy. That was the other thing that appealed to me. Steam trains, of course, because I'm old enough to remember just about the uh, the end of the steam era. So a bit of a long and convoluted answer, Paul. But yeah, several things kind of rattled through the brain at, uh, at that time when you asked me the question. Oh, wonderful. Well, it's been, it's been a delight to catch up with you. I'm pleased to see you're keeping busy, uh, you know, and um, so I'll pop some links that people can get in touch, say hello, and um, good luck with the French. Très bien, merci, monsieur, and uh, au revoir. And same to you, Paul. Good catching up with you. Look forward to catching up with you again soon. Wonderful. Take care, Hugh. Yeah, bye. cheers, Paul. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.